the elections to match the introduction of smart card reader in Nigeria's election. If you don't have the permanent voter card, you are powerless as it has to do with elections. You are voiceless. And as a matter of fact, we say it's permanent voter card, a.k.a. make your choice. You can't make a choice if you don't have your permanent voter card. And the sun, however, remains on more voter education, for both the process and deepening Nigeria's democracy. To the political parties are supposed to be the major stakeholder in terms of educating uh, citizens about issues of the electoral process because these political parties are the ones who are beneficiaries, primary beneficiaries of the electoral process. They are the ones that see. Because a country has an agency that needs to enlighten the country before. They have to be proactive. So I urge National Orientation Agency to be proactive in this respect. Not only in this voter registration. But the politicians are the beneficiaries of these uh, electors. Once they go to vote, the, the higher the number of voters, the more they will benefit out of it. Uh, the, 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 you, you, you see, if you leave it at the hands of the politician, party will only give information that is benefit to them. However, by whatever yet still, political observers believe democracy is the best system of governance because it allows for choice. Ayuk actually can only be done by only people who participate in the process. But the electorate is for them to get their voter cards and participate in choosing whom they want to elect as their leader. Reporting for Deadlines Resisting, Abdullahi Garbabun. To Abdullahi, rather than express frustration on the performance of a government after elections, the only way to secure the future of a country is by using the PVC to decide the right leadership. And that's why our next set of reports will give a situation across the country. Our starting point is Kanum, one of the states with the highest voting population in Nigeria. And Fatima Sanusi Karaye is our guide. Population is one of the fundamental features of Kanu, and it plays crucial role in elections, with an estimated population of about 11 million as of 2011. Kano State has been described as one of the states in the country with high number of registered voters. According to Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, there are about 4.9 million people who registered as of 2015. Today, that number has risen from 4.9 to 5.2 million people. But the question here is, do these people know the power of voters' card? A 65-year-old Hajia Hasatu of Kololo village at Bichi local government area of Kano State is one of the classical examples of people with voting power but lacks adequate knowledge to apply it. This could be due to cultural inhibitions which seems to weigh her electoral decisions down. My card is at home. I will go out and vote. But if my husband said we should go. It is important to know that electoral process is one of the bulwarks of democracy with voters as major stakeholders. I registered first of all in order to, uh, to be a patriotic citizen of the country. Secondly, in order to use my voter's card to vote for the person I wish. I want to vote the person I know will work for people like me. I have voters card because I want to vote someone who will work for me. I'm a Nigerian. I love my country and my state. So I will use my power to vote who I think is fit to lead me. The local government dinner. There had been some concerns that underage voters may have been used to boost election outcome in the state, but stakeholders are resolute in the state electoral process. Do you have the um, cases where young uh, people that are not up to age are registering here? No, we don't have any of that kind of cases like that. That's under 18. We don't have any children or any pure person who has been registered in our local, in our local government. Independent National Electoral Commission in Kano is working hard to change the tide of voter apathy so that the likes of Hajia Hasatu can appreciate their voting power to change the political landscape. Then could you just talk a little about this voter apathy? Very often you hear that, well, even if we go out to vote, our votes do not count for a simple reason that uh, there is a perception that elections are likely to be manipulated or 
should be rigged in a way that uh, voting doesn't matter. I think over the years we have seen improvement and I think the confidence is being regained. This effort may come to a note if eligible voters who are registered fail to collect their voter cards as currently there are more than 250,000 unclaimed permanent water cards which are in the custody of INEC in Kano. Here in Kano, people are taking the advantage of the continuous voter registration to obtain their permanent voter card ahead of the 2019 general election. I have gotten my own. I hope, Hawa, you have gotten yours too. In Kano, Fatima Sanusi Garae, deadline 360. Very well, Fatima. But let's join on Nengie Fine Phase in Port Harcourt, South, South Nigeria, where we understand awareness on the significance of the P, they say, is on the increase. If you must not come out to come to vote, ask them, we're supposed to not come out. But as you come out like that, I bet we could go beg them for us. We could do the vote, ask them, beg. We don't try. It's on the whole of us. Six months, not all I don't chop, or less of this, or power, buy, why they chop. I will call you by December, I said this year. Now, this year, I even came because of this vote, ask I did not do my VVM on my bank. There's no way I can withdraw money. See it now, there's still turning or say we should come back later, come back later. It's not good now, which is. With our task card now, we cannot vote. Number one, it's very slow. Let's tell ourselves the truth. And number two, they don't have manpower. I would only recommend that the government should make it the systems more available than this, so that uh, if we have more numbers of systems here, you know, it will make the job easier. These complaints on loss of man has inadequate staff and direct data capture machines, unfriendly weather and environment suffered during the long hours of waiting, and the sheer irritation of regular visits to INEC offices for what should be a simple exercise characterized the continuous permanent voter card registration collection exercise at the onset in 2017 and early 2018. The electoral umpire, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, responded swiftly. Political party leaders, individuals and groups joined the train of public enlightenment on the importance of PVCs. At the commencement of the voter registration exercise in River State, INEC offices in literally all the LGAs were filled to capacity by voters who were eager to get registered. At that point, it was all complaints about how difficult the processes were. Today, the case seemed different. In fact, here at the Potako City Local Government Office of INEC, for the first time, we see people seated comfortably under the cover of a shade waiting patiently to get registered. Well, as I can, I don't see plenty of people, but I never have to wait much time. I have to take my hand. That is very easy to come and very easy to go. With the positive changes recorded in many INEC registration centers, and with a little more commitment to extend same to all local government areas of the state, one can only expect that by 2019, all eligible voters in over state would have received their permanent voter cards. For Dateline 360, I'm on Fine Face. Not only rivers, but all over Nigeria on NGA, many thanks. Ironically, while the initial mixed feelings in Nigeria's South South is being replaced with optimism, Tonua Lokbe Kainde in Ogun State has what could be considered disturbing. Hundreds of residents of Abeokuta, she reports, are yet to claim their PVCs. In less than a year to the general elections, registration and collection of permanent voters' cards have become more crucial as the level of sensitization is daily on the increase, even in the southwestern area of Nigeria and particularly in Abiyokuta, the Ogo State capital. No doubt, the eligibility of the electorate on the day of election is dependent on the PVC as the only instrument that guarantees access to the ballot box. However, as many as are better sensitized are willing to obtain the voter's card even though the process seems cumbersome and time consuming. For the past four hours, we are still waiting because we don't know when they will not call on us. This is St. Peter's Anglican Primary School, Ake Abiyokuta, one of the INEC voters registration centers in Abiyokuta South local government area. You are here for the voters registration. What has been your experience? How has it been? Yes, over two hours ago I have been here. Everything is going fine. Everything is going fine, smoothly. Yeah, absolutely. 
so you're optimistic like in a few minutes time you'll be done here yes in like one hour's time everything will be done of concern however is the number of unclaimed pvcs across ogo state out of about 1.6 million plus that registered, 425,000 PVCs are yet to be collected. Than never before, the electorate in the states are now better informed of the power of their votes, beginning with obtaining the permanent voters' card PVC for deadline 360. I am Tolu Arapa King. Awareness of the importance of the PVC without actual possession, the electoral umpire says, simply means giving up the power of one's voice in matters that affect such. Now, to Nigeria's northeast, where Naomi Aboko is on standby to bring us to speed on the situation there, considering the peculiar nature of a people displaced due to insurgency. Since the commencement of continuous voter registration exercise in April 2017, about 300,000 eligible voters in Borno State have successfully registered. The exercise started with 27 centers, constituting one each for all the local government areas in the state. In Borno, we have just about 69,000 PVCs that are yet to be claimed. And this uh, accounted to issues of double registration, multiple registrations, and uh, PVCs of deceased persons. The number of CVR centers were later increased with 21, making 48 due to massive turnout of people with cases of loss of PVCs resulting from displacement caused by the insurgency. For communities still taking refuge in Medugri, CVR centers were established in all the internally displaced persons camps, making it easy for eligible voters to participate in the exercise. I advise the public, especially those in the IDP camps, to please not register more than once because that will be will uh, count against the total voters in the state as part of effort to ensure eligible voters get to register in areas hard to reach around the state INEC Borno state in synergy with Nigerian Air Force air lifted staff and electoral materials to Ngala Kalabalge Mobar Dikwa and Benki Local council chairmen, on the other hand, have also been mobilizing their people on the need to obtain the voter's card, stressing that it is the only way to effect change in the democratic process. The effect of the insurgency has not deterred the IDPs in the camps and within host communities coming out to register. And with the awareness programs making huge impact with significant population obtaining the temporary and much later the permanent voters' cards. However, this is a clear indication of prospects for massive turnout of voters coming 2019 general elections. For deadline 360 in Medugri, I am Naomi Abu. That's the spirit, Naomi, not allowing one's situation to deprive him or her of rights enshrined in the Constitution. And to our last bet this week by Saliu Abdullahi, the focus is on the role of stakeholders in the electioneering process to educate and empower the electorate to make informed decisions regarding candidates. Political observers believe that one of the fundamental steps to having a smooth election is educating the electorate on how to make right decisions in all the processes of election. This is in line with experts' views that elections cannot be genuinely democratic unless voters are made to know and understand the means plans and programs of various contestants which in turn will equip them to cast informed votes and make right decisions. People need to know who is running for an election to a legislative position or to an executive position that the decision they are making to vote for a particular person is the right one. After elections are conducted all those involved in the election monitoring uh, end up criticizing the electoral empire, in this case, the Independent National Electoral Commission. 2019 is just around the corner. Can we know what uh, the Intercontinental uh, Leadership Initiative intend to achieve in terms of educating the electorate? In practical terms, I'll be addressing the youth of Nigeria. I'll be addressing the youth of Nigeria because the youth, uh, a lot of people will say, Ah, uh, the youth have not been given chance in Nigeria. Uh, the youth have been marginalized in Nigeria. But is that really the case? 
Some people go to the extent, oh, the same old men we saw since seventies up to now, there are still people living. The question is this, are the Nigerians ready for leadership? So until we stop stomach infrastructure, we cannot get developmental infrastructure. Records from the Independent National Electoral Commission, INIC, and some election monitors have shown that in the 2015 general elections, only 68 million people, less than 38% of the country's population, participated due to challenges of voter awareness and education. Uh, and that's why we've been working on the legislative side of things to get a, a, an electoral act in place. Uh, we've been advocating for an electoral offenses commission so that it's in place that will then bring people to account for failures to um, obey electoral laws. Um, keep an eye on what the electoral commission is doing, uh, draw to its attention the challenges people are having, whether it is with registering in the continuous voter registration exercise, identifying themselves in the voter register, or even um, coming out to, to, to come out and vote. In a short while, Nigerian electorates will be interacting with politicians from about 68 political parties, even though the messages they will be sharing with them is not yet known. How does INEC intend to empower prospective voters through education. We are going to have a lot of interaction apart from training with nearly every stakeholder that we have for 2019 general elections. How experts believe that if key stakeholders re-strategize and educate people on best ways to be actively engaged before, during and even after elections, it will be better for the nation's democracy as the best candidate will occupy the right positions. In Abuja, Salihu Abdullahi for Deadline 360. Indeed, Salihu, with political campaigns for the 2019 general elections expected to start in earnest by November the 18th, an election proper by February 2019, there is no overemphasizing that fact. Today in Nigeria, the only legitimate instrument that guarantees accessibility to the ballot box and by extension who determines the fate of the people is the PVC. What's your PVC status? Be part of this conversation through our platforms, Deadline360 at nta.ng or at NTA News Now. Thanks for being part of this edition. But remember, your vote is your power. Use it wisely. Many thanks and bye for now. watching NTA Nigerian Television Authority For more information and news updates visit our website at most authoritative, educative, and entertainment breakfast show, Morning Ride. Morning Ride, 
better improved now comes to you for one and a half hour every saturday 10 to 11 30 with added packages which include the news updates trending on the social media children's gist in addition to the regulars just for your viewing delights and you can catch our repeat broadcast ads for participation and advert placements please contact the producer or call our marketing department on Morning Ride Enjoy a jolly good ride This is MTA Tuesday Live, and I'm Cyril Stober. And Nigerians are basking in the euphoria of the release of the Dapchi girls who were held in captivity for 31 days. Now, the release of the girls, coming after the government pledged to bring them back safely, has been described as a demonstration of matching words with action in the commitment to the security of lives and property. Now, it has been categorically stated that there was no swap and no ransom paid, but negotiation that is globally accepted and practiced. Now, what are the lessons that can be drawn from this, and what input for the remaining Shiba girls who are still in captivity? Now, these are some of the issues we'll be raising tonight after this report by Adibola Brooklyn Sunday. The abduction of the girls no doubt brought back the painful memories of a similar event in Chibok in 2014, which took the doggedness and political will of the Buhari-led administration to rescue most of the girls. All over traditional and social media, the news was trending. Both Nigeria and her friends were asking, why are the girl child the target of the insurgents? In demonstration of his administration's proactive nature, President Muhammad Buhari ordered the immediate search and rescue of the girls. Not left to any stone unturned in making sure that the girls are rescued. Following the directive, the Nigerian Air Force flew about 50 hours in a surveillance drive that covered northern fringes of Borno State and bordering Niger Republic. We, we are very optimistic that uh, whatever we are doing will ultimately, by the special grace of God, lead us to where uh, these girls are and so that uh, they can all be uh, rescued and reunited with their family members. Few days later, the Minister of Defense, Masuda Ali, led other federal government delegation to Dapchi to deliver a message of hope and commitment of President Buhari towards ensuring the safe release of the girls. The visit of the delegation paid off as the girls were released after 32 days in captivity. And this was a cheering news for Nigerians both at home and abroad. <laughs> <laughs> Following their release, the president ordered some ministers to move to Dapchi to take charge of activities. 
The government steps attracted commendations from Nigerians and some of the nation's friends. I really commend the government, the government of Nigeria, to make all this effort to bring them back. The first step, in, and uh, it's a good one, and uh, I really congratulate the government of Nigeria. I'm happy for them, and I think schools should create more tight securities. However, the girls, including a boy, were given a state reception by President Muhammad Buhari, where he sounded a note of warning to service chiefs. I want to thank you for saving our lives. What blessing you, sir? Security chiefs have been warned in clear terms that any laps on their part will be viewed seriously. And when the nation was celebrating the release of the girls, the issue became politicized. Their campaign to unseat Paramount Buhari is fueling their desperation. Nigerians should prepare to see more avalanche of disinformation and fake news in days to come. But they should also not lend any credibility to such reports. They belong to a trash can. At some point you would even assume that uh, the leading opponent to our administration, which is the PDP, it's, it's like they were clinking glasses in their office that Dapchi girls had been stolen. They have to look for a strategy if they have to win the next election. They are not going to win the election on the basis of Dapchi because we have won back the girls. Though the girls have since been reunited with their parents, but Nigerians still await the safe return of Leah the only girl remaining in the captivity of the abductors. Some of the questions begging for answers now are, what will happen to the only boy among the released victims of insurgents who has been out of school? And what else can or should be done to forestall a recurrence? Adebola, Brooklyn Sunday, NTA News. All right, that report sets the tone for the first discussion we're having tonight by the way tonight it's uh it's a double deal tonight because uh, we're going to be having two topics but first let's uh, bring you to the first issue we're dealing with and uh, that's the release of the duchy girls i'd like to introduce to you uh, guests who will be joining us on this discussion uh, let me welcome to this uh, program the Special Advisor to the President, Media and Publicity, Mr. Premier Adishina, thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Good evening. We're also here tonight with uh, Brigadier General John Temlong, who's the pioneer commander of the Multinational Joint Task Force, BAGA, and he's the President of the Alumni Association of the National Defense College. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Good evening. All right. And uh, joining us from our Maiduguri studio is Major General Nicholas Rogers, who is uh, Commander Operation Lafia Doli. Thanks for being with us here. Thank you. And also joining us from our Lagos Network Center is Captain Umar Aliu, a security analyst. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. All right, as we always do on this program, we acquaint you with the procedure. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screen. We, ad we advise you take advantage of those platforms and join in the discussion. Now, however, for those who will be phoning in, we say this every Tuesday. When you get through at the appropriate time, do us a favor. Turn down the volume of your TV set. Just reduce the volume. Uh, that's the best way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know that your call has been passed through to the studio is you'll see your name appear on screen. Once you see your name on screen, it means your call has been passed through to the studio. We advise that you go straight to the point, ask a question or make a comment. I guess we'll respond to such issues as you might raise. And uh, let us, let's also say, don't bother too much about greetings. Just go straight to the point. Once you see your name appear on screen, go straight to the point. Don't bother about all the greetings. So thanks for joining us. And once again, welcome to NTA 
Tuesday Live. It's all about the release of the Dutch schoolgirls. And uh, Nigerians generally, and particularly the parents of those girls and the, Chibu and the Dutch community, woke up to the news that the girls had been released. I know so much has been spoken about it in the last few days, but take us through it again. How did this happen? Thank you. Well, uh, the country woke up on Wednesday. It will be a week tomorrow to hear the good news that uh, the girls were back. Uh, according to the, the negotiators, the release was to take place on Thursday, but the insurgents decided to bring them in on Wednesday. And they did it at the first light of dawn. So that Dabchi itself woke up to see the girls in the center of town. All those who say it happened uh, during the day and who have been passing pictures around on social media just created those things. Because the truth is that at the time the girls came, you couldn't have taken any sensible picture. And of course, the way Boko Haram came in full force, nobody would wait to take pictures. So all the pictures that are circulating are just uh, make-believe. They're not real pictures. So they came very, very early, dropped one girl in, I think, Gaydam, because that was where she came from. And as they were passing through, she must have indicated that that was her own area. They dropped her. And then they went to Dabchi and dropped the remaining. From there, it became public knowledge that they were back. Right, okay, but well, as you've just explained, um, why so many issues were raised about that was um, people thought, well, if the insurgents decided to bring back the girls, no one had any inkling. Now, was that part of the negotiation as to grant safe passage yes. to the insurgents so that they could come in, drop the girls, and then leave without any challenge whatsoever? Yes, it was part of the deal. The deal was that the insurgents insisted that they wanted to bring the girls back themselves and there had been some ceasefire agreements not known to the country a few days before. So the ceasefire held for some days till they returned the girls and they left. All right. Well, we'll be taking up other issues on this. But Let's at this point go back to our Maiduguri uh, studio where we have the commander of operation Lafayette Dole. Now with this happening, I suppose the first thinking of people would be, well, there are still some girls being held in captivity in uh, Chibok. And so they said, with all what has happened about Chibok girls, a number of them are still being held. How did the Dapchi thing come to happen? that uh, the insurgents just moved in and uh, they had free reign and they took away the girls. Uh, well, thank you for, uh, well, thank you for, for this uh, question. Uh, what happened was that um, we are deployed um, across the theater and then when we, um, we reviewed the strategy of our deployments and did the risk assessment. Uh, there were threats in Kanama and Gaidam and other fringes bordering the Niger Republic. And based on that, we had to move troops forward because Dapchi has never been attacked since the issue of insurgency started in this country. And as I speak, Dapchi has never been attacked, was never attacked. And uh, because of the gap and the massive land space we have, it wasn't possible for us to cover all the gaps in land space in our deployment. And these are the gaps that the insurgents used to come into Dapchi and take away the girls. We expected uh, when we left Dapchi and moved forward to Kanama, Gaidama and other places in the far north, we expected other security agencies to take control of the places that have been liberated. Uh, so that was the gap. Right. 
there are, there are those who have said that there are many, many, many questions. Now, I would just like you to set the record straight. In the wake of the release of the girls, there were many conspiracy theories. In fact, at some point in time, there was a, something of more like an argument between the military and the police. And some people went out and said, look, the military hierarchy was directed to withdraw. And uh, as soon as they had done that, the insurgents went in and took the girls, suggesting that there was some, sub, some sort of conspiracy to take away the military commanders from the military station around there so that the insurgents could do it. How do you respond to that? Um, for those who don't have um, basic military knowledge, they can say that. But that is not true. Deployment in the theater is based on threat analysis and um, for us to deal with the situation and the challenges of the insurgents. The idea of leaving Diapchi to move further, not only Diapchi, and other places to move further to confront the insurgents, particularly in the border areas because uh, they've been defeated in the hinterland and they are now moving too far off to the shores of the lecture areas and areas bordering Nigeria and Niger borders, and Nigeria and Cameroon border, and the shores of the Lake Chad between Nigeria and uh, Chad. So it was premised on this that um, troops have to be relocated based on threat analysis. Um, there was no collaboration by anybody or any force to say uh, any instruction from any higher headquarters asking soldiers to withdraw. We can't withdraw, we only move forward. We couldn't withdraw. The use of the language withdraw. Um, I think it's very wrong with the military terminology. We just moved forward, we didn't withdraw from Dabchi. And we expected, like I said earlier, when we expected other security agencies to take over all the military places. If they've not done that, then that's an issue. Because I know there was a letter written to some other security agencies as far back as January 2017, and also in April last year, asking them to take over these places and be liberated. And if they didn't do that, then uh, they, they can be asked question why they didn't do that, but that will not stop us from uh, moving forward to occupy spaces where we think there are gaps to deal with insurgents. Let's come back to our Abuja studio here, and we have Brigadier General John Temlong here, and uh, we're looking at this scenario. There is um, an ongoing war against insurgents to dislodge uh, the terrorists, and um, so far. At a point in time where Nigerians were beginning to breathe with relief that um, the insurgents had been using the terms that we have all heard all the time, decimated, and they're not as degraded, uh, degraded <laughs> and they're no longer as strong as uh, they were. And suddenly, uh, they moved in with ease. At, you know, yes, that she was not, never under threat, but is it not the way we think? Insurgents look for sub targets? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, insurgents always look for sub targets. And if you know the terrain that we're talking about, having operated in that area for a long time, it's quite a vast terrain. It's impossible for you to cover everywhere with troops or with manpower. The, the problem uh, that we have, and when, which I've said often here, is that you defeat an idea with a superior idea. The, the whole issue is an ideological thing because they want to impose their own ideology. They want to impose what they want and, what, and that's how they'll be able to radicalize people, recruit people. The force of arm is there to keep you in check and when you cross the Rubicon for it to be dealt with. Now when you deal with this aspect, you have not actually defeated the idea. And so definitely you must take steps until you defeat the idea itself. Then you will now say that you have defeated the whole concept of Boko Haram as a whole, as an ideology. Now when you degrade them to that extent, they will definitely be looking for soft, because soft, uh, soft targets because they will not be able to withstand the might, the kinetic might of the armed forces. And so they will move in the gaps. And the danger or the problem with asymmetric warfare is that they are within you. So they know where you are deployed. They move to you as friends or as people of that community. 
are they're carrying our reiki they go back and see where the gaps are and they infiltrate into those gaps and uh, as, the, as the terror commander said rightly is that when you do a threat assessment you continually evaluate the security as you move on as you as you fight and uh, when areas have become less threatened you move forward to confront why you think or why you have been given information or why your intelligence have told you that there are threats there so it's normal for the military commander on ground to move and relocate his forces it's, nobody will sit down here in abuja and start telling him to deploy his troops here 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 no it's not done that way he has been given an assignment there in uh, Medigua. It is him who will now do the appreciation and estimate of the situation in that place and deploy his troops accordingly to combat those troops. So nobody will sit down here in Abuja, the commander in chief or the chief of defense staff or chief of army staff and say, put one soldier here, put one unit here, put one unit here. Then it means he's no more in command. Then it means they're commanding from here. So for every action that is going to be taken, then he has to wait there. So it's, it's, it's an abnormal in military operations. Once you are given your task, you are given the resources to accomplish that task, it is your responsibility to deploy your troops accordingly to deal with the task and achieve the objective that you have been given to, uh, to achieve. So the problem is, is easy for them, bearing the vastness of that area, and in the absence of technology that we don't have, which is supposed to be a force multiplier, because if you have technology, then technology can cover areas that you are not physically on ground and be able to relate to you. So that force multiplier is missing. Because if you had eyes on the sky, eyes in the sky, it would have been easier for the commander, whether he is with Meduguri or he would have moved to the front line to be able to see and monitor all the gaps and all the areas in this area to see the movement and infiltration of terrorists to the areas they are going to do. So definitely we have to bring in technology as a force multiplier in this crisis. And it has to be what it should be, it should be in the future. Definitely we must look at technology. The idea of man, human, manpower, yes, is there, but technology must take the lead. All right. Let's go back to our legal center now. And uh, Captain Umar Aliu was there with us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we put the same questions. You know, we just had the Brigadier General Tim Long talk about uh, technology. And uh, with all this happening, you have a situation where just about every Nigerian has become a security expert overnight. And you hear all kinds of comments. So, so put this in perspective for us, please. Well, ever since the situation uh, happened, I'm talking about the kidnap of the Dabchi girls, uh, social media has been agog, as much, as, many, as much and as many narratives as you can imagine, narratives bordering from the ridiculous to the incredible and all that's in between. And that's not unusual when you have platforms where people can go. From my end as an analyst and in my consults, we pull this cesspool of narratives and we begin to kind of look at them from a dispassionate perspective and just see what exactly the stuff is and what the distractions are. I recommend that to all our military, paramilitary, and uh, allied agencies. There is no room for neither is there room or need for acceptance, but there is actually room for us to look at what is being said and glean off what we can from it. Now going into the issue of what uh, General Temlong said, we cannot and I say again, we cannot begin to hold that ground you call the Northeast until we are able to establish what you can call an absent presence in areas where physical manpower cannot be deployed. What do I mean by absent presence? You can call it virtual presence. And technology encapsulates all of that. 
cannot begin to spread our soldiers across the vast terrain within that theater of operations. Because you cannot do that, what you require is to have, as the general said, force multipliers. And these force multipliers come in various, various uh, forms, one of which is to have what you can call a virtual presence, a virtual area, bed's eye view of the terrain. And there are enough options and solutions for doing that, options that can actually pick people moment they transcend or exceed certain numbers, options that can pick movements, options that can even pick vibrations, as in vibrations that can be made by five, six, ten vehicles in areas where on a good day you shouldn't have vehicles. These things are very key to assist our troops drive the momentum of their missions. So if we decide to actually go get our girls released, and those little loopholes remain cycled. You want to see what I call a recycling of the scenario. What is a recycling of the scenario? The insurgents will never take the Nigerian armed forces in pitched battles again. That's what being decimated and degraded means. That does not mean they've been obliterated. And we agree as security practitioners that a chain can only be as strong as its weakest link and expect the insurgents to take you from that weakest link. So what we are looking at today is where we can begin to strengthen the weak links. And it's not about the army alone. When we talk about the Northeast, most people just think army. No. Other sister security agencies, down to even security practitioners at the local level of traditional rulers and their security, their local native security chiefs, they all have a role to play. But then this role has to be enforced, has to be leveraged by giving the core arms of our, our fight in the Northeast the required technological edge on the situation as they will require. We'll return to you in a moment, but um, back here with uh, Mr. Femi Adishina. Some skeptics have raised this question. Can you really say that no ransom was paid? Because they say, well, I've heard comments like uh, some girls were taken away, a large number of girls, over 100 were taken away. They were kept for just about a month, a little over a month. Of course, while they were in captivity, the insurgents, the kidnappers, the abductors, at least to some extent, fed them, kept them somewhere, and uh, it would have cost something, no matter how little, somewhere, to keep a hundred plus girls in captivity. And uh, if they would so gladly release them without a dime, the skeptics ask, so what was the point in taking them in the first place? And there was no swap, as you say. It's not as if we we'll really release some of our members and then we'll give you back the girls. Yes, we, we, it's a matter of whether we believe or we don't. Mm. There's a saying that to those who believe, no explanation is necessary. But to those who don't believe, no explanation is possible. Mm. So, it's either you believe or you don't believe. Uh, we have heard from those who championed the negotiation, particularly the DSS. They have told us no ransom was paid, no swap was done. Is either we believe or we don't believe. Mm. I happen to be among those that believe. It mm. suits me fine. Mm. Those who don't believe, I don't know what attracts them. I don't know what spurs them into that unbelief. But I think uh, it's good for us as individuals, it's good for us as a nation when we believe our leaders particularly those who have proven themselves to be people of integrity. If I have not caught a leader lying to me before, whatever he says, I choose to believe it. But the day I have caught him lying, then I may be between and betwixt when he tells me things, whether to believe or not. We do have some Nigerians who say they want to know the details, and yet you hear security experts tell you that there's nowhere in the world 
that uh, the details, the fine details of negotiation can be released to the public. And that these are highly sensitive and security issues that cannot be in the open. Now, a lot of people would like to point to countries that say they do not negotiate with, 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 uh, with, with terrorists and ask why can't Nigeria be like that? What do you say here? Thank you. As a policy, some countries will tell you that they don't negotiate with terrorists. But we have known that uh, in the past, even the Americans that spearhead that, they have done some negotiation with terrorists, and including swapping here and there. Uh, so it is in your own national interest. Actually, it's your national interest that you look at. It is in our national interest to have these, our daughters, back to us. Uh, it is in our national interest to have them back alive. Yes, you could decide to use kinetic force to try to free them, but the danger there is that you might lose some of them. Now, it's not possible to give out the fine details of all these negotiations because sometimes some people are, that are involved will not want to be named. It put them at risk. And it probably, at the same time, too, it will make the terrorists uh, to lose confidence in you too at a time. Because sometimes it even includes some outside countries that are involved in the negotiation and they don't want to be named in the, in the negotiation, so it definitely do not. But as time goes on, uh, usually you declassify information. And uh, there is a depth of writings actually that has been going on in this country. People don't write out the experiences and the rest. But I'm sure that in the future, people will continue to put mm. down these things in the future. And these fine details that we're looking for, if we are alive, they will come up. All right. Well, our lines are already open and uh, the calls are coming through. We have calling in from Biosa. Osborne. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I really appreciate your your program today. And it, it's true that uh, around some is not said about this uh, kidnapping of the Bunchi, the Bunchi girls, it should have been a better one from the the government. And most I will be so glad that this thing done amicably. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I appreciate help. Thank you. And God. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Osborne. Now back to our Maiduguri studio, General. Yes, you did say that um, Dabchi had never been attacked. Uh, Debchi was not seen as a threat. But in the light of what has happened, has the status of Debchi changed now? Um, well, after um, what happened in Debchi, we have to strategize again and take another look at the general um, deployment in the theater. That I've done and I've made some adjustments. And um, some of these things are not what I'm coming to the air to tell people how I've deployed, but I've done make some adjustments to make sure that some of these areas that are vulnerable are well protected. And uh, thank God the president has given much in order to the Nigerian police and civil defense to take care of the schools in the Northeast. So we are more concerned in protecting the local communities now. But the deployments are basically military deployments and not for public consumption for now. I suppose that uh, the, 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 the people of that community and Nigerians everywhere would like to know because we heard that the terrorists also issued a threat even as they returned the girls and said if they, if, if they went back to school then they would, they, would, they would come down hard on them. What can you say about that and can you assure the nation that that will just remain an empty threat? Well, that is a terrorist strategy. They've been doing that right from the outset, trying to condemn Western education. But we have our own strategy to deal with the situation. Um, the girls have been located to other schools that are peaceful in town, in places where we think they are well secured. So the issue of Dabji is still a problem for us. We've marshaled our strategy to take care of Dabji. Not only Dabji, but some other towns that we think they are vulnerable to attacks like that. But like... Um, the Captain Omar said, and General Temlong said, the terrorists will always go out for us, very soft targets, and uh, the issue of confronting Nigerian army, I don't think we we'll have a space where the terrorists will come out and want to confront the Nigerian army. But we we'll have issues of maybe hitting soft targets, and uh, that is part of 
terrorism and the concept of terrorism. For a long time, we have issues of that challenge. But we also ask the local community to come up with their own local strategy to protect their communities while we do our own at the strategic level of military uh, operations and tactics. All right. Okay. Well, back to uh, Captain Umar in Lagos. Um, you spoke of uh, the nation developing new strategies um, to go beyond this. What are the best strategies that you can develop at this time? Because, you see, it's been said over and over again that um, what we're dealing with is not what you will surmount totally with force. And that, uh, you know, the examples in other countries of the world, even well, uh, highly advanced countries that have had to deal with situations like this over years, that it, it never really ends. Of course. Once terrorism of course. Once terrorism sets foot in your national area, you don't expect them to leave overnight. Terrorism is a business. As long as the social, cultural, and political environment accommodates what they look to exploit, then they'll stay there. And uh, talking about these solutions, that's a very interesting question. But let me start by telling you directly that the solutions and strategies we seek are not military, have nothing to do with the military. I'll ask so that I can align your thoughts. Shouldn't we have a blueprint by now in the Northeast for doing things, not counter-terrorism now, but anti-terrorism? What I simply mean is, have we had blueprints for how schools should be run? Have we had blueprints for how gatherings, religious gatherings, probably exceeding 200 people should be run? We have blueprints for marketplaces and how they should be run. What is the blueprint for, no puns intended now, customs, immigration op operations in northeastern Nigeria? Can they really s use the same strategy they guard the borders in Idi Roko to do the borders in the northeast? What is the police blueprint for operations? in counter-insurgency environments or anti-insurgency environments. What role must traditional leaders, religious leaders play? You see, <laughs> fighting terrorism is one big cocktail party and everybody has a role to play. It's not an exclusive army guns boots thing. The army is not perfect. They have their setbacks. But then I tell you, if we want to talk strategy, then we don't even need military strategies at yet. That which we have done to decimate, degrade, suffices. We still need to go down to bring about strategies at those little, little, you know, weak areas of this chain I'm talking about. We must strengthen it or else they will just exploit that. Those are issues we'll take up with our other guests here. But let's go back to the phones and uh, we have Williams calling in from Calabar. Hello, Williams. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, our program today is quite commendable. Um, it's a part of the program of national because, uh, like the analysts are just there, I think they point said that terrorism is a big business. And it is a big business. You see, issues that are coming up in this manner are a bit uh, putting intellectual strategies into the market where kidnappers who come, kidnap children, and uh, return them back, no ransom, no negotiation, no, no, what I mean, no ransom was taken and all of that. Who is shopping on who's head? Who is um, making, who is controlling others? I mean, how does it sound that people will come, negotiate, and you can expect them to negotiate back the, the, the children, and you can't capture them? In this case, I'm not talking about the army. They are doing a very good job to protect the country. The U.S. is also doing the same thing. But if we can identify the people we can and negotiate and get back our children, why can't we stop them at the, at the, at the point? So please, many more efforts is geared towards resolving this issue once and for all. It will, it will, it will bring Nigeria to a perfect place. Thank you, sir. Right.
Thank you very much, uh, Williams. Well, right here, um, Femi Adishina, and uh, we talk of blueprint strategies. It's not a military thing all along. And um, we see that uh, even as efforts have been made to stem uh, the insurgency and uh, take charge of, uh, I mean, improve security in the, in the country, there's always the element of politics in it. Yes, but um, I, I, I'll say it's a bit unconscionable when you begin to play politics with everything. It depends on the kind of politics you said now. Is it politics as in politicians exploiting the situation? Exactly. Or People wanting to make gains out of situations? It, 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 is, it is regrettable and uh, anybody that does that is somebody to fear. Because when you see misery, when you see unfortunate things, and you begin to cash in on those things for political ends, then uh, you lack conscience. You lack conscience. When Dabchi happened, some people were actually rejoicing, saying, well, under a certain administration, Chubok happened. Now Dabchi has happened. It's 1-1. One -one. Doesn't make sense doesn't make sense because these are small girls and these are parents that are distraught and you are seeking how to make political capital out of what has happened. I think uh, 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 anybody that does that is somebody that you don't have to trust. Mm -hmm. Somebody that you don't have to give your vote to because that is something you should never play politics with. We go over to Bill Kerry. We have Mahmoud on the line. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Sova. Uh, nice to have you guys on the line. Hmm. Um, my contribution goes to the special yeah. advisor to the president. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my contribution is the special advisor to the president. Right. Um, that Captain Umar from your Lagos um, studio is always there with channels and other social and other media houses giving good security advices. Does it mean that the president or the presidency does not take advice from all these people? On a personal note, I would like this kind of guy to be a special advisor to the president on security <laughs> issues. He really has something to sell. And um, look at his experience and things he sees based on this insecurity. I've been following him for some time now, both on AIT, on channels. He's doing a very good job, and yet we still have these issues. Things he sees are things that do come to pass again. We should please try not to let this program just go for waste. We should always let this kind of program to encourage other people call in and say good things. All right. Introduce him well if he sees his advice, taking off. These are the kind of Nigerians we need, not the ones that will go and politicize things. They have things to say, but they will make it political. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Baru. Well, uh, the special advisor is here. The question was... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, the captain is a security analyst and I'm sure he's a consultant. There yeah. are many ways in which he can work with the system. And uh, I, I, I am sure that he can interface mm -hmm. with those who are in charge of our security, security apparatus. Well, at this point in time, uh, we'll bring you the views of citizens. We took the cameras out and uh, we wanted them to respond to uh, these happenings in society. Let's get to see what our correspondents brought back. All right, looks like uh, we have uh, some challenges with bringing that, but uh, we do assure you we'll get uh, the citizens' opinion on this issue that we're discussing we'll bring that to you uh, just as soon as uh, we can fix whatever hitch 
All right. Okay. So we can take it right away. Let's see. All these cool guys. I'm very happy. Before, but now we are free. No kid now for Cardinal. We thank God. The security is okay. So if the federal government can put more with uh, this thing, facility in this schools, I think it's better that way. We still hear they kidnap them, they take them. So what is the reason? What is behind it? So the government should do more. The intelligent gathering should they should go for the intelligent gathering very very well and check meet what is the cause. I believe we can see a lot of difference in terms of security. But to me, federal government they are really trying. Well, the voice of the people there, and uh, eh, perhaps we should go back to uh, my degree studio and uh, talk to the theater commander and say, look, well, all this has happened. The, the, the uh, Dapchi girls are back. There's one girl left, and Nigerians are still worried about that. And let's also remember that there are still some Chibok girls left. Yes, we are aware of that, but I am also aware that um, the federal government is handling that issue, just like the way he handled the FG issue. I think stream and social media, and in the wake of negative comments on the security situation in the country, many Nigerians have expressed disappointment with statements by otherwise prominent senior citizens which are seen as capable of threatening peace. Now that's the subject of our second topic on Tuesday Live. Um, let me introduce our guests to you. We have here joining us in our Abuja studio, Major General Nuhu Ambazo, who is a Chief of Civil Military Affairs of the Nigerian Army. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, sir. And also we're joined by Dr. Chidia Madwekwe, Managing Director of the Nigerian Film Corporation. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Right. General, of recent we've heard uh, so many things been said um, and accusations that the Nigerian army may not be neutral in terms of conflict. In fact, some have outrightly said that the army is partisan. What, how do you respond to that? Well, thank you so much, uh, Cyril and uh, NTA, for providing this uh, fantastic platform for um, you know, the Nigerian Army to be able to explain some issues here. Uh, first of all, um, you know, the Nigerian Army has over the years conducted operations in line with its constitutional rules and uh, also in aid to civil authority. So um, these operations and exercises were duly authorized and um, it is done with absolute professionalism. Now let me just uh, step back a little <coughs> bit to just um, further let the nation know that uh, you know one of the first steps that uh, the current chief of army staff uh, uh, took when he took over command was to articulate his vision, which was very clear, that is to have a professionally responsive Nigerian army in the discharge of its constitutional rules. And those two are pillars that actually have to do with professionalism and responsiveness. So, um, and that has been the guiding principle of all of our exercises and, um, and the conduct of our men in the field because uh, we also have, you know, the various rules of engagement and uh, uh, the code of conduct which are derived from this vision. So um, that in itself is putting in place a proactive measure by the Nigerian Army to ensure that the conduct of all of its operations are done with absolute professionalism. Now. Over the years, we have seen the nature of our threats, and then, of course, the nature of the warfare that we get, or that we are going to be involved in, which has to do with asymmetric warfare. 
And uh, you know, that has been an area where the, the Nigerian army has been, and other uh, services have been multitasked, and at the same time, they are very much involved in, um, in the asymmetric nature of warfare, which involves having our adversaries living even within and amongst the citizens. All right. So there is that likelihood that there are some misunderstandings, misconceptions that... Uh, the the Fifth Amendment in the United States made it clear that not all speech can be protected, particularly when the speech is uh, intended to call for an imminent lawlessness in the geographical uh, area it is meant to apply. Uh, with all due respect, it's a revered general, a man who has paid his due, but you know, one cannot understand and one may want to sympathize with him. If at this twilight of his life he will want to watch this country he labored so much to build, to come to eat abyss, I guess that's not... He may have been angry, we don't know why he was angry, but then I guess he went too far to bring such a calamitous statement to bear on the Nigerian army, particularly when we know that this very Nigerian army have been paying the supreme sacrifice, even in his own state of Taraba, it's very gruesome to watch a Nigerian army or hear for the Nigerian army being beheaded in this current. It's very gruesome during the bad days of the Boko Haram to watch a Nigerian you know, military air force officer being uh, you know taken out from the field because his ill-equipped uh, you know fighter plane or, or helicopter was brought down by Boko Haram. It is sad to watch Nigerian army being, you know, decimated by a ragtag insurgents. And then one of us will come and now and say that um, this Nigerian army, uh, you know, will be taking sides. And on that watch as Minister for Defense, <laughs> you deploy the same Nigerian army to take care of, um, you know, a whole village as the case may be. So I think it is, uh, it is a sinister call, particularly when you take it in tandem with other similar symmetrical commentary coming from other people. You know, this is a typical example of what politicians do when they want the military to take over government. All right. Um, you talk about other people and uh, politicians, but let me come to general. Does it make it any more um, difficult for you to uh, uh, put in true perspective that statements like these are not coming from the quarters uh, the military usually refers to as a bloody civilian who knows nothing, but coming from a senior comrade at arms, does that say anything to you? Do, do you worry about that, that if a statement is made by, you know, people with uh, uh, military background as well, um, knowing that the uh, citizens might say, well, he should know because he's one of them. Uh, well, uh, so uh, the fact remains is that um, the Nigerian army does not intend to join issues with anybody, mm. uh, especially to such as him who has actually commanded this very same army. However, um, you know, the statement that was uh, made uh, made it very clear that we will continue to remain uh, you know, are political. We will continue to do our jobs in, in a very professional manner. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, usually exercises like this, uh, there is, uh, you know, an after, re by after exercise report, you know, in which, um, you know, there, there is a postmortem of the conduct of such exercises. Mm. However, um, I can categorically tell you that within the powers of the Chief of Army Staff himself, uh, he has already directed the Department of uh, Policy and Plans, which actually, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, initiates the policies of the Nigerian uh, Army, to to set up an investigation uh, right. panel, and uh, that panel is with the intent of really looking at our own personnel on the ground. All other issues we have the supervisory, uh, you know, headquarters, the defense headquarters, we have the ministry, and they are handling, uh, you know, other issues. But um, the Niger Army is more concerned as to the issues that were brought up to right look into, uh, you know, what our troops, uh, what our commanders, in particular in, in Taraba State, uh, because basically uh, the Nigerian army is deployed there for exercise uh, I am a partner and um, 
we believe that by the time this panel goes in, it will be able to, uh, you know, bring out uh, a lot of issues that um, that uh, will help the chief of army staff and the army headquarters to be able to command and control the army in a much, you know, uh, right. which is the same uh, question I put to Dr. Badwick, for instance. And so some said, yes, scathing as those remarks might have been, perhaps you should look the other side. And um, why is smarting under such remarks from one of them? It might be time for the institution to take a look at itself and see perhaps there are gaps anywhere where it would need to take care of to avoid uh, uh, any misunderstanding if you so put it around that say after all uh, the general who made the state statement is a human being himself he also has feelings yeah one cannot say that the nigerian army all of a sudden is 100 percent perfect we all witness to the massacre that happened at baga some time ago during the former administration which cost us uh, a very warm relationship with the united states government so you find out that uh, certainly when you deploy the military to contain some of these forces, there are times they can go on the excess. But in engaging, when you make a speech or make a comment, you have to weigh it, you know, and know where it tilts. Nigeria is a highly combustive state that um, in trying to check maybe if there are, quote unquote, any excesses of the Nigerian military in in the in the operational levels of IAM, 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 IAM Akbata, that's the cat. Um, uh, operation, the cut rest, you will be careful not to tilt the balance in a manner that will suddenly now have more work for the Nigerian army. Assuming the, the people over there now start carrying arms as they have been asked to defend themselves to maybe imaginary enemy that is not there, it will be creating more loot on the Nigerian army, whom we know are already very st stretched. So the bottom line is that we have to be statesmanly in making this comment. You have access to the military high command, the Raya boys. You can inform them and I think they will take you very, very serious. Uh, even a few days ago, there were reports of uh, soldiers being killed in uh, Kaduna uh, State, for mm -hmm. instance. How does this impact on situations like that? Exactly what I'm trying to say here, that you have to be careful how you raise, how you, how you demonize the Nigerian army. That is the the sole remaining unity, symbol of our unity. If you brush them in a fit of anger for whatever may have happened because you don't feel too comfortable about them and they start being thrown stone at or being killed anyhow, you know, we are left bare as a country, 200 million people. These people are right there on the front line. They are not perfect, but I'm saying that there are one million ways of bringing them. They are under civil authority these days they are not as ambitious as they used to be before so you have all the i mean the civilian uh, line of command to readdress any imperfection in them not to bring them out in a manner that me and you know may not have any proof or test of time as we look into this what what's uh, civil military relations like I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Um, well, incidentally, I am the, the Chief of Civil Military Affairs for the Nigerian Army. And uh, I can assure you that uh, this department was uh, created uh, in 2010. And uh, it, it is actually aimed at bridging the gap between the military and the, the, you know, the civil society. And, um, uh, you know, the aim of the department is to be able to ensure that all issues having to do with military interaction based on our current threat analysis in which we are now dealing with asymmetric warfare. And it means that we will see ourselves more d being multitasked and being closely, you know, uh, operating within, uh, you know, uh, civil, civil domain. Um, you know, during the time when it was conventional warfare, you, you can predict where the enemy is. It's way across the river. Hmm. And, uh, but now they are all embedded within. So it presupposes that there will be times in which there will be friction. All right. And as a result of that, before I just quickly end, uh, you know, as a result of that, just last year, the Department of uh, the, the Human Rights Desk of uh, the Nigerian Army was, was, was opened by 
by the current uh, administration, by the chief of army staff, in which all issues having to do with perceived, you know, human rights abuses were are, are to be addressed. Likewise, too, we have the call center, you know, um, in which which is available on, on number one nine three that you can call from any part of the country where issues having to do with complaints, if we, issues having to do with operational, uh, you know, uh, uh, security related matters, can actually be, be, be uh, you know, called to the center and there is a person there who will be 24 hours, okay. will be able to, to, to pick up. So these are all avenues in which we are trying to ensure that the civil military relations is is uh, more robust and much much uh, cordial. Right, we have on the line from Maiduguri IODG. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Good evening, Hello. Hello, IODG. Are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, I'm affected to the civil man of style and language. What do we do about this thing? The other step of the human center. We uniform rifle and try to show people that the weather for in the town. Sorry, we didn't quite get that, I you? Could you repeat this, what you just said? I said, so what do we do about the state trucks and the soldiers that go about in the town? And the federal centers with their rifle or uniform? Oh dear, I'm not sure I can hear you. Unfortunately, we still can, we still can't get that. Can you try one more time? You, you, you're extremely you're so low. Okay, I mean the army officer on on patrol. We think the people can go about the rifle on uniform to entertainment center. Well, maybe you might have to call back. The only thing I can make out is something about a rifle and uniform. Yes. Um, it's it's not it's not it's not it's not getting through really. So, uh, just sorry. Well, maybe we might we might have to ask you just just call back and uh, okay. see what we can do. All right. Yes, there have been issues of friction. And uh, like you said, it's, uh, it's normal when you have operations like this going on at such critical times, people are on the edge. But how should the citizens relate with uh, uh, the military, the army? The citizens should continue to have confidence in the military. Indeed, they should have a sense of pride that uh, these are people who have led, led the comfort zones of their home. And uh, they should be able to give them support in any way they see them. If they see them walking on the road, they should be able to, you know, even give them a ride if they are in the market. They must be made to understand that we cherish them. We understand what they are involved with. It's not easy for one to sign up to say, I'm ready to lay my life to defend you. And then there are now uh, civil uh, points that have established, like he talked about the Human Rights Unit and the call centers. They're all available for us to call, to make a report as to certain bad behaviors we've noticed in the Nigerian army officials, as the case may be, so that they can take it off from there. But we must appreciate them, we must respect them, we must value them, and from there we can see to it that they make any amend. All right, back to the phones now. Okay. Have we been able to retrieve that call? Okay, this is another call. This one is from Lagos. Kashim calling in from Lagos. Hello. Hello, Kashim. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I just want to appreciate... Others at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas was in charge of the money bag, some of the disciples thought that Jesus had told him to go and buy. As the whole scenario, he looked at the military man, so he was talking to.